In 2006, I started writing a blog on my website, DaveMcLeod.com. But I thought it was about time that I started making these blogs in video form. So this vlog is going to be about all things climbing. My blog covered topics related to everything to do with improving at climbing, enjoying climbing, just getting the most out of it. And in this vlog, I'm hoping to do some mini series about all sorts of different topics, such as training, injuries, nutrition, practical skills, and of course, some of my own climbs. But I was thinking about what would be a nice thing to do for an episode one. Uh, so last week I put out an invitation for you to ask me some questions and make episode one and ask me anything. Um, I got well over 100 questions. <laughs> I'm not going to try and answer them all in this episode. In fact, I thought the best thing to do would be to take each of them in turn and give a decent answer because many of them do require a little bit of digging into some science or just some detail and nuance. The first question I'll answer for this episode is from Toby and Toby asks, how do you manage to perform optimally at any time of day and night? In your books, you stress the importance of good sleep, and yet you also seem capable of climbing your hardest in the middle of the night. I've always found it difficult to get going very early in the morning for pre-work sessions, and the warm-up takes a lot longer. Do you have any tips? Well, the first thing is, I don't climb well at any time of the day or night. <laughs> um, I have put out some videos of myself training in the past, uh, quite late on in the evening, like uh, sort of 11 p.m., but at that time, I was getting up quite late in the morning and I was sleeping for 10, 11, sometimes more uh, hours in the night. That was actually just before my daughter was born. My daughter is now seven years old. And these days we have quite a fixed routine um, of getting up for school. <laughs> um, so the result of that has, you know, has a knock-on effect on my own uh, routine and especially my training, which has shifted much earlier in the day. So this question is an issue of circadian rhythm regulation. And you, you can, to a certain extent, especially when you're young, um, break the rules of circadian re regulation, for a while at least. But ultimately, that is a battle that you will not win. <laughs> it will catch up with you sooner or later. So the sooner you get into the habit of working with your circadian rhythm rather than against it, uh, the better. So specifically for someone who has to train early in the morning, the whole goal is to shift all the circadian regulation cues earlier in the day. As the years go on, um, more and more research finds melatonin receptors in more and more cell types in the body. Almost your whole body is sensing light via mel melatonin. Um, and uh, there are also several other inputs uh, to circadian regulation, one of the main ones being food. So melatonin is the hormone that we produce uh, when it gets dark and we're not seeing light, your body will start to produce melatonin uh, after sunset or lack of exposure to light. And then after a few hours, you will start to feel sleepy and be ready for sleep. Um, and if you expose people to bright, bright light, especially blue light late in the evening, that will suppress their melatonin and it will suppress their sleep, interfere with their sleep. And even very brief periods of uh, light exposure in the middle of the night will interfere with your sleep as well. But one interesting thing that happened recently was the, the discovery of melanopsin produced in the back of the eye uh, in response to bright blue light exposure, uh, which is outdoor light. Even a brightly lit indoor room is no substitute. It's not even close to the light exposure that you get from outside. It's September in Scotland, still getting slightly midged. And it seems like this melanopsin pathway is really a strong regulator of circadian rhythm. So in that way, you can think about it that if you don't have the melanopsin right, everything else will not work nearly so well. Uh, so there are several key behaviors to adopt if you want to shift your wakefulness early in the morning in order that you can feel awake and you're able to pull hard and train and therefore respond to the training. The first is when you get up, go outside, even if it's just for five minutes, even if you just go and stand outside and see a bright light first thing in the morning. If that's not possible, there are some workarounds like a light box. They're pretty cheap, you can get them because a lot of people in the world suffer from seasonally affected disorder um, and use light boxes all the time. Then you come to the, your light exposure pattern in the evening. So you're trying to, while you're trying to get your blue light um, in the morning, you're trying to avoid it in the evening. And you'll get blue light from your phone, your computer, uh, indoor lights, your TV, all of these things. So the number one low-hanging fruit for 
uh, reducing your blue light exposure in the evening is to not take your phone into your bedroom and not use it late at night. Second to that would be take your finger, move it to your social media apps, press delete, <laughs> get rid of them. Don't use it on your phone because it's so tempting to, to, for many people, not everyone of course, um, to use them late at night. Try to finish your screen time work or entertainment as early as you can in, in the evening. And there are some additional things. So the lighting in your house is a source of blue light as well. So you can buy some, some bulbs that, that have that spectrum taken out. I think it's Philips Hue that does them. A really good tool if you share a house with other people who don't want to live that way with, with very little light, especially blue light uh, late in the evening, is to use blue blocker glasses. I have a pair of these myself. Um, I must admit that I don't use them as often as I should. Maybe I should think about that. I'll maybe do an experiment and see if it works on my sleep and I'll report back in a future episode. The last thing you can do is to shift your eating window earlier as well, if you want to shift your circadian rhythm earlier. So one of the other strong circadian sensors is the liver. So when the liver uh, has an input of, of food and calories, then the liver thinks that it might be the morning or at least the daytime. So the earlier you give the liver breakfast, the earlier it's, it feels that the, their circadian rhythm, the day is starting, and the earlier you stop the calories being supplied to the liver, the sooner it thinks that this might be nighttime and time, time to wind down to sleep. And the key thing is that both the light scheduling and the eating scheduling are in sync as well. So that means eating when it's light or eating when you're exposing yourself to light and not eating when it's dark or before you want to a few hours before you want to go to sleep. So getting all those main circadian regulators all in the right place is the kind of foundational thing. But one other aspect is your ability to actually make melatonin. Um, now, to make melatonin, melatonin is made from serotonin and serotonin is 5-hydroxytryptophan. There is not many uh, foods that are high in tryptophan. It's a particular amino acid component of protein. Um, but uh, a range of meat sources are definitely the best source seafood being the very best. Uh, so make sure you're getting plenty of tryptophan. Often people will supplement 5-hydroxytryptophan in the evening. Um, other cofactors in that process are vitamin D and magnesium and a whole host of the other B vitamins. Uh, so I personally su supplement magnesium uh, just because it can be hard to get in the diet, especially the type of diet I'm on. Um, and further exercise and psychological stress will deplete both your magnesium and your vitamin D. So I also supplement vitamin D because I live in one of the wettest parts of the country. So the question is, are you giving your body the signal to make melatonin and are you giving it the raw materials to make that melatonin? And if you get all those things working well and there's still a sleep problem, then you can look at some other things. One other aspect is the environment of your sleeping area. Is it completely dark? like completely dark. <laughs> the difference between nearly completely dark and completely dark is really huge when it comes to melatonin production. Um, so you, you really want to get a proper blackout line so it's black so that you, if you need to go to the loo in the middle of the night, you need to use your phone, otherwise you can't see a thing. Temperature is also another thing that's really important. If your room is too warm, then you won't sleep well. And actually, if you can lower your body temperature, that's also a signal for your body um, to, to start to sleep. So many people who are researchers in this space take cold showers or alternating hot and cold showers before bed to cool their body temperature down. And this appears to work really, really well. And then there's of course, there's just noise disturbance in your bedroom. So can you eliminate that in any way? So you should really want to make your bedroom as cave-like as possible, completely silent, completely dark, and nice and cool. And all of those things applied together gives your body a really strong signal for wakefulness nice and early before you come to do your training and then uh, time for sleep nice and early well before you need to. And for me this is one of the hardest aspects to get right about training. Almost every night I find myself berating myself for not doing it properly. Um, I need to actually be really really strict about the rules otherwise I won't follow them. Um, so I also share the difficulty with this especially because that morning routine for me because of my family is kind of rigid, I can't change it. And so if I don't get it right, if I stay up too late or if I break those rules, if I'm looking at screens too late, often I'm editing video, uh, then 
my training is suffers the next day. There's no doubt about it. Okay, so the second question I'll tackle just now comes from Fezip, and Fezip says, uh, thanks for the initiative of your vlog. Brilliant, no problem. Um, I look forward to the vlogs. As a new parent and passionate climber, um, my more or less obvious question is, what advice do you give someone who has increasing family and work commitments, i.e. limited time? So this kind of flows nicely on from the last question. And still wants to keep uh, the same level of climbing, but to improve as well, uh, whilst also spending as much climbing time on the rock rather than, rather than in the cellar. What's the key to square the circle? Well, to me, the key to square the circle of getting your time on rock is to live near the rock climbing, <laughs> as close to the rock climbing as possible. So I come from Glasgow, big city, uh, well, relatively big city. Um, and I realized that to really make my life a life of a climber, I needed to live right in the heart of the climbing. So I moved to the Lochaber area, just under Ben Nevis. There's climbing of all types in a radius right around my house. I can get to the highest mountain in the UK in nine minutes drive from my house. And that is absolutely key so that there's just endless climbing and it's right there and there's a whole spectrum of climbing so that uh, even though I live in quite a wet part of the country, if it's wet in the west I can go east, if it's wet in the east I can go west, whatever you like. Uh, today it's pouring with rain, I don't know if there's many other climbers climbing in Scotland but I've come to this nice overhanging cliff that stays dry in the rain. So all of this is about maximising the opportunity you have to get on the rock within minutes. Um, so that if you have half a day, even a couple of hours, you can still get onto the real rock. I know that question has within it a lot of complexity. You know, that means everything from implications for your family, implications for your job, all of these things. That go, you have to go back to square one and think about your life and how you want to set it up. It may be an issue that takes you years to solve, but it's still worth doing. So the other part of this question relates to time. So for a lot of people, a good strategy is to arrange your week so that you can get out for one day or two days um, to go to the crag for a whole day and do the type of climbing that you really enjoy. Um, and then for the rest of the week to arrange your time around your work and your work productivity. And that often leaves you with not enough time to make it to a climbing wall or a crag to do a proper workout. And let's say you have half an hour, let's say you have 10 minutes. So I thought I would just maybe um, give you an idea for a workout that you could complete in 10 minutes and all you need is a fingerboard and you can put up a fingerboard anywhere. If you can hang it under a set of stairs, a tree, off a building, you can find somewhere, anywhere to hang a fingerboard. So all you need is a fingerboard and yourself and 10 minutes. So if I only had 10 minutes, you can do a really effective workout which at minimum will maintain your strength and maybe endurance as well. But actually, I think for a lot of people, they could probably improve on this if they did this every day. So there's a lot of research showing that even one set per day of a maximal strength effort can improve both strength and muscle mass. So here's a 10 minute workout which has six exercises. It has two body strength exercises. It has three finger exercises covering the three main grip types and one endurance exercise. So first up, there is a push-ups exercise. Now again, for any strength activity, you want this to be activating those type 2B fibers. It's gotta be hard. And for most people, push up, just a standard push-up from the ground is just a little bit too easy. But if you do them with really strict form, they are much, much harder, and I would definitely recommend doing that. But to make it hard enough for my level of strength, and my push-up strength is pathetic, um, I put my feet up on a windowsill and do it that way. Another way to do it, if you're even stronger, is to walk your feet up a smooth wall as you do the push-up. Um, or another way is to start getting into handstand push-ups, or one-armed, or whatever. You can adjust the exercises. The point is, you start off with that, and you just do as many as you can. Um, as long as that many isn't too many, then you have to increase the intensity, so that you, you're not getting above like 10, you know. It has to be like, kind of, ideally around five or six would be a good number up to 10 as a maximum. Now, you're trying to fit all these exercises into 10 minutes total, including the warm-up. So the push-ups is something you can tend to do as your warm-up, uh, even though it's a maximal exercise, I think it's safe to do this uh, as a, as a warm-up, as long as you're not coming from a totally untrained state. So I'm assuming that you have a background of doing having done some training before you do this, but you can jump straight on and do the push-ups 
and that will warm your body up and get it ready for some, some uh, harder work. The rest of the workout is done on the fingerboard here. This is an edge board. Um, the first exercise is just to do a maximal pull-up exercise. Uh, so again, it's a strength exercise. It's got to be hard. Uh, for a lot of people, they can do uh, lots of pull-ups. I can do 20 or more than 20. Uh, so that's like more of an endurance exercise at that point. So if I'm gonna do the exercise on two arms, I'd have to add weight. But for a 10 minute workout, that necessitates putting on a harness, hanging weight from yourself, whatever. Better to do it with one arm. So I can just about do one arm, a one one arm pull up most of the time. So a great exercise for me to do a one arm pull up and then drop down as slowly as I possibly can. Um, just a brilliant exercise. If you're not quite as strong as that, somewhere in between, you can have a bungee or something similar that you can hold on to, another hold, whatever make it up as you go along, adjust it so that you get to the right intensity. So you do, if you're doing one arm, you have to do each arm, obviously. So one set of that, and then progress to one maximal fingerboard hang per grip type, which is four fingers open-handed, three finger open-handed drag, and crimped, or as we usually use on the fingerboard, half crimped. So you're doing one set of them, 10 second hang that's maximal. Again, adjust the intensity so that you reach 10 seconds as your maximal, so you're failing then rather than voluntarily stopping then. Take about a minute and a half or maybe even a minute in between the sets. And then the final exercise is just an endurance ex exercise. So the middle rung of the edge for me is a great uh, size to do a, a maximal number of pull-ups. So it's an all-out sprint interval basically uh, where I'm, well, if I can do I don't know, around 15 to 16 pull-ups uh, on uh, the, the middle rung of the edge. So this is everything you've got, full on maximal anaerobic effort. And that's it, six exercises and you're done. You can go back to work, you can go back to taking care of your kids, back to your daily routine, which I'm sure is very full. But in that 10 minutes, you've done a really high quality workout, which sends a, a message to your type 2B fibers, the ones that are hardest to recruit, that they need to be maintained, they need to be stronger. And you may well even gain muscle mass on that protocol, um, especially if you're coming from a relatively untrained state. So thanks again for sending in all your questions. In the next couple of episodes, I'm going to deal with some practical skills related to climbing. And then I'll return to more of your questions and go through them one by one. And they cover a whole range of everything you can think of related to improving at climbing. So looking forward to answering those. If you want to make sure you catch all of those, please do subscribe to my channel. And I'll see you in the next episode. Oh, 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 oh,